Thank you, Dr. Kreider, our worship team, for leading us uh, this morning. Thank you, Dr. Stinson, for your very generous uh, introduction. I want to uh, echo back that one of the greatest uh, delights in the last uh, year, year and a half, has been getting to really know Dr. Stinson, our uh, provost, who was dean of roughly half of what is now part of the Billy Graham School uh, before me. Uh, it is not an understatement to say that I would not be the dean of the Billy Graham School today if it were not for Dr. Stinson's uh, friendship and belief in, uh, in me, and I uh, will never forget that. Grateful for you. It's a joy to work uh, for you and with you uh, serving here at Southern Seminary. It's a joy to have so many dear faculty colleagues, both within the Graham School, School of Theology and Boyce College here. It's a joy to see you here this morning for uh, the ministry of the Word of God. So. Uh, with that in mind, let me invite you to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter number 2. The book of Acts, chapter number 2. We're going to look at verses 37 through 40 as our focal text this morning. And I'm preaching on this subject, what must I do? What must I do? Acts, chapter 2, verses 37 through 40 is our focal text this morning. If you have found Acts chapter 2, let me invite you, if you would, to stand with me. Let's honor the reading of the Word of God together this morning. And let me invite and encourage you to follow along in your hearts as I share this Word from God's Word. This is Acts chapter 2, verses 37 through 40. And this morning I'm reading from the Holman Christian Standard Bible. The Scripture says, When they heard this, they came under deep conviction and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what must we do? Repent, Peter said to them. And be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words he testified and strongly urged them, saying, Be saved from this corrupt generation. Please be seated, and may God richly bless the reading and study of his word together this morning. We're intrigued by that which happens first. Uh, we love first things because that which happens first tends to be a model or a pattern in terms of how those who come behind or that which happens later tends to measure and evaluate itself. We think about, for example, of course, the founding of this institution in 1859 and our first president, the visionary and courageous James Pettigrew Boyce, and how every president who has come since then stands upon the shoulders of the foundation, the legacy that was laid by Dr. Boyce. We think about other firsts in, in life. In thinking about the ministry of the church, in thinking about our calling and responsibility as those who ultimately will have the, the teaching and the preaching ministries of the church, the privilege we have of proclaiming the gospel, of calling people to trust Christ as Savior and Lord. We cannot escape the example of the first church in terms of a method and model for ministry. Which may be why, on a personal note, the book of Acts is my favorite book in the entire Word of God because it lays out the, the history and the heritage of the, the founding believers, the, the, the church alive. And here in our focal text this morning, we have the first gospel response. Some would say the first invitation in the history of the church, a passage that is so filled with uh, implications for us in terms of what it means to have a, a faithful ministry of, of the Word and a ministry that is calling people to, to trust Christ. What does it mean for someone to come to a saving knowledge of Christ? And what is our responsibility as faithful evangelists, faithful heralds of the gospel? What must we do? So what I'd like to do this morning in our few moments together is just kind of walk through this text and offer four takeaways, four truths in terms of the process that all of us go through, in terms of what it means to come to a, to a saving knowledge of Christ, what it means to, to obey and to respond to the gospel that should help form and frame our understanding of what a, an authentic gospel ministry looks like. Notice, first of all, that there is the experience of conviction. There is the experience of conviction. Verse 37, when they heard this, they came under deep conviction. Now, of course, we need to clarify contextually what the this 
was that they heard. You know, of course, the storyline of the book of Acts, that beginning in chapter 1, Christ in his resurrected state prior to the ascension commissions his disciples once again. We know that the Great Commission is found five times in the New Testament, once in each of the four Gospels and in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Then Jesus is ascended. They gather into an upper room. And of course, on the day of Pentecost, the 120 who were gathered there are supernaturally and sovereignly empowered by the Spirit of God in a marvelous way. Back at the beginning of Acts chapter 2, we have, of course, the scene, verse 2, a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were staying, tongues like flames of fire. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in, uh, in different languages, literally dialect, dialectos, dialects. The miracle of Pentecost was not tongues. The miracle of Pentecost was that everyone there could hear the gospel in his or her own native language. And there's an experience that is remarkable, but of course, it was also confusing. There in verse 12, they were all astounded and perplexed, saying to one another, what could this be? But some sneered and said, they're full of new wine. Verse 14, but Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and proclaimed to them, men of Judah and all you residents of Jerusalem, let me explain this to you and pay attention to my words. Now, do not miss the importance of what just happened there. It is a reminder to us that experience is not enough. Experience is not self-interpreting. Experience has to come under the interpreting framework of the Word of God. The response to experience was preaching. Peter proclaims. Verse 15, for these people are not drunk as you suppose, and it's only nine in the morning. On the contrary, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel, and it will be in the last days, says God. He begins to quote the Old Testament prophet Joel and the fulfillment there in this context. Verse 22. Men of Israel, listen to these words. This, this Jesus, the Nazarene, was a man pointed out to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs that God did among you through him, just as you yourselves know. Though he was delivered up according to God's determined plan and foreknowledge, you used lawless people to nail him to a cross and kill him. God raised him up, ending the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. He quotes David. Verse 32, God has resurrected this Jesus. We are all witnesses of this. Therefore, since he has been exalted to the right hand of God and has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, he has poured out what you both see and hear. Quotes David again in verse 36, the capstone, the climax of the sermon. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Amen. That's Christ-centered preaching. He declares the Messiahship of Christ. He declares their own sinfulness. He declares the resurrection. And therefore, in verse 37, when they heard this, when they heard the gospel, when they heard the truth, literally they were pierced to the heart. They came under deep conviction and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what must we do? They had received God's revelation and they knew they were guilty. They knew there was something that they needed to do and they recognized that the answer was not within themselves. They didn't conclude, okay, I know what to do. They needed to be told what the answer was. They needed to know how to respond. That it wasn't within them. This, of course, is conviction. Preparation is what God uses to open hearts to, to receive the word. This, of course, harkens into what Jesus said to Nicodemus about what it means to be born again. Acts 16, the Spirit opened Lydia's heart to receive the things of the Lord. 
It's in the context of conviction that salvation is understood and received. And my friends, authentic biblical preaching should bring conviction. One of the challenges, I'm afraid, in our culture today is the reason why we're not seeing the kind of gospel response we'd like to see, the reason we're not seeing the kind of conversions and the kind of evangelistic fruit we ought to see is maybe because somehow we've moved away from the kind of preaching that the Spirit will use to bring genuine conviction and brokenness. We become far more enthused about trying to entertain and amuse. We'll spend more time trying to pick out the right YouTube clip we can show before the sermon rather than just to preach the Word and believe that it's still the power of God that He uses to draw sinners to Christ. The sufficiency of Scripture. The power really is in the preaching of the Word of God. There's something about what happens when a man of God filled with the Spirit of God takes the text of the living God and declares the reality of our own sinfulness, the person and work of Jesus Christ, and that there is forgiveness available. People won't know that they need to respond until conviction comes. Conviction is a work that God accomplishes through the agency of gospel preaching. That's why we are unapologetic in the centrality of the pulpit ministry, the centrality of preaching in the life of the church, that preaching is the central act of worship in the life of the church. And notice that Spirit was so heavy upon them They're crying out, asking, what must we do? There is the experience of conviction. Secondly, not only is there the experience of conviction, but secondly, there is the exhortation to repent. The exhortation to repent. The question is asked, brothers, what must we do? Verse 38, repent, Peter said to them. Now, those of you, of course, who are reading from your uh, Greek New Testament know that the A word that is translated repent there is in the plural form. So we could say, again, if we were uh, wanting to be more specific, y'all repent. (laughs) But of course, as many of you know, uh, y'all can be both singular and plural depending upon the context. So maybe, Dr. Stinson, we ought to say, all y'all repent. (laughs) Repent. Notice that The first thing Peter says and emphasizes in terms of gospel response is a clarion call to repentance, literally a turning from sin and a turning to Christ. May I remind you that there is no authentic gospel proclamation, that there is no true salvation apart from a clarion call to repentance. That repentance is is not an addition to the gospel, it is the natural outflow of what the gospel demands of us. We see this, of course, modeled by Christ himself. In fact, let's do just a a quick Bible study, shall we? Flip back a few pages to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, verse 14. Mark chapter 1, verse 14. The Bible says, after John was arrested, Jesus went to Galilee preaching the good news of God. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. And what does Jesus say? Repent and believe in the good news. Notice that the first thing Jesus preached was a call to repentance. Right? Flip over to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. Look at verse 44 of Luke 24. Luke 24, verse 44. The Bible says, Then he told them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He also said to them, 
This is what is written. The Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead the third day. Verse 47, and what? And repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Repentance was the first thing Jesus preached. It was the last thing Jesus told the disciples, the church, to preach. And in Acts 2, it is exactly the first thing the church proclaims. To repent. To turn from sin, to trust Christ, to break with unbelief. Literally to do a 180. Going in one direction, away from the things of God in sin and rebellion. And turning toward Christ. This is a message that is so critical, so necessary, and yet so often in our evangelistic presentations, we tend to stress more of the the positive side. Just trust Jesus, just ask Jesus into your heart, just believe, all of which is wonderful, that cannot be divorced from a call to repentance. There can be no turning to Christ apart from a turning from sin. The exhortation to repent. All of you repent. Thirdly, there is the evidence of the Holy Spirit. The experience of conviction, the exhortation to repent, the evidence of the Holy Spirit. Repent, Peter said to them, and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. We'll come back to that in just a moment. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, just as the word repent was in the plural form, the word receive, you will receive, is in the singular form. That is, those who repent are the ones who receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Literally, His indwelling presence within us. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now notice, of course, that there is no uh, claiming here of uh, you'll receive a a gift of tongues. There's no claiming here of you have to have a laying on of hands or some second work of grace or some second blessing. That literally at the moment of a person's conversion and salvation, that person is baptized with the Spirit of God. That person is sealed, is indwelt with the Spirit of God. And a person who does not have the Spirit of God within himself or herself is not a second-class Christian in need of a second blessing. That person is an unbeliever. Romans chapter 8. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ within him, he doesn't belong to Christ. There is so much confusion misunderstanding and a lack of clarity about the ministry and the work of the Holy Spirit that it has almost led many of us within Southern Baptist life to kind of marginalize or put on the periphery the ministry of the Spirit because of the excesses we see in some tribes within the Christian faith. Yet the necessity of the ministry of the Spirit of God is so critical because the Spirit of God is the agent of our salvation. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Of course, those who respond that day do. They receive the gift of the Spirit. Apart from the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, we are nothing. And there's no greater demonstration of that, of course, than Acts chapter 2. Because the last time we see Peter pre-cross... He's not exactly ready to go out and charge hell with a water pistol, is he? He's not even singing, Dr. Kreider, I'm a friend of God. He was the one, of course, the rock, who said, listen, even if all these guys abandon you, I'll still be there. Listen, I will never deny you. And literally the rock crumbled. And Peter stabbed Jesus, not in the back, but right in the front, when three times he denied himself, I don't even know this man. Yet something happened that freshly baptized with the Spirit of God, this one who was a denier, this one who would run in the face of opposition, God would transform into a powerful 
proclaimer of Christ, who would become, of course, the main figure in the first part of the book of Acts and who would go on to be martyred, of course, during the persecutions in the mid-first century. Many have said, of course, that the book of Acts is really the acts of the Holy Spirit. 3,000 are converted here in Acts 2, 5,000 soon. One New Testament scholar speculated that within a period of six months, over 60,000 people constituted the New Testament church. That's biblical church growth. That is something only the Spirit of God can do. We trust in our marketing schemes. We trust in our finances. We trust in having the right location. We trust in having the, the largest staff. We trust in all of the things of this earth. And maybe it's no wonder that we don't see these kind of results today because maybe we've tried to say to God, listen, God, we can handle this. We have figured out a way to do church and it absolutely not require the power of the Spirit of God. But can I ask you a very direct question this morning? What is it that you do in the context of your ministry that so honestly and desperately requires the power of God that it would be doomed to fail if God didn't show up? We don't, we don't, we don't make provision for that kind of a failure, that kind of ministry. We've become very professionalized very educated. We know how to do it. We've got the consultants and the gurus, the pollsters and the pundits. But there's one area where we desperately need a recovery of the primacy, of the ministry of the Spirit of God it is within our own lives, within our own churches. The desperate reliance upon the Spirit of God. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Not just you're going to have a wonderful life, even though you will. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Fourthly, not just do we see the experience of conviction, the exhortation to repent, the evidence of the Holy Spirit. Fourthly, we see the example of believer's baptism. The example of believer's baptism. Verse 38 again, repent, Peter said to them, and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. Now, this is one of those uh, texts that many uh, Baptist brethren kind of want to shy away from because just on a, a plain reading of this in the English, it would kind of lead you to think some things that you ought not to think. Uh, on, a, on a very surface uh, level reading of this text, you might be tempted to think that this text is teaching that a person must be baptized in order to be saved, or what we would call baptismal regeneration. The baptism itself is somehow salvific or regenerative. And just kind of on a straightforward English reading, and be baptized each of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Well, that seems pretty straightforward, doesn't it? Well, you know, I think it's good every now and then uh, in the chapel pulpit of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary just to preach a little Baptist doctrine, uh, which is just Bible doctrine here, uh, that literally, uh, of course, you know this uh, phrase, this uh, verse, repent, plural, Peter said to them, and be baptized, each of you, the you there is singular, just like the receive is singular, in the name of Jesus Christ for, now of course if you have your Greek New Testament in front of you, you will see that the word for is the uh, wonderful little Greek particle ice, epsilon iota sigma, it's a fascinating Greek particle, it has a variety of uh, ways it can be translated. It can be translated for purpose or result, uh, for, on the account of, on behalf of, as a result of. And context has to help guide us here. For example, if you were uh, watching the, uh, the evening news tonight, if you still watch the evening news, and there's a lead-off story on a murder trial, where the verdict has finally come in. And the leadoff reporter on television says that tonight, John Doe will be going to prison for the murder of Jane Smith. Now, does that reporter mean that John Doe is going to prison in order to murder Jane Smith for? No. That reporter means that that person is being sentenced to prison because the murder has already been committed. 
That literally is what Peter is proclaiming here. Repent. All y'all repent. And those of you who do repent, be baptized. For on the result of, on the occasion of having had your sins forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, those of you who do this. We know that, of course, because that is the example of the New Testament, particularly in 1 Corinthians 1, which I won't turn to for time's sake. Paul proclaims the gospel, and he says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, but to preach the gospel. I think it would be the height of of incredulity for us to assert that Paul was somehow a half gospel preacher or Paul wasn't preaching a full gospel. Paul knew what the gospel was better than any of us. Paul said, for Christ did not send me to baptize but to preach, but to proclaim the gospel in 1 Corinthians 1. Baptism is non-salvific. It doesn't save us. There's nothing magical, mystical, or holy about the water. It doesn't regenerate us. Baptism is the public profession of faith. It is that public declaration that I am united to Christ. It is that public testimony that I have been buried with Christ in the likeness of his death, and I'll be raised in the likeness of his resurrection to walk in obedience to Christ. And certainly those of us who bear the name Baptist ought not to sell that doctrine, ought not to sell that identity cheap. For short, baptism is central to the life of the church because it is the public profession. Those of you who call upon the name of the Lord, in fact, he mentions that there in verse 39, for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, perhaps a reference to distant generations or Gentiles, as many as the Lord our God will call, which of course reminds us there in verse 21, What he's already mentioned, then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Notice that there is divine calling and there is human calling. And that divine calling, which is an effectual calling, when God calls, we respond. We cry out. We call back. We call upon him because he has called upon us. We cry out to him because his Work is taking place, is taking place within us by the agency of gospel preaching, by the work of the Holy Spirit. He is calling sinners who will cry out to Him, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, save me. What must I do? Now, if it just stopped in verse. 39, we'd probably be tempted to conclude that that was enough, but don't miss verse 40. And with many other words, he testified and strongly urged them, saying, Be saved from this corrupt generation. I think Peter had a little passion in his preaching. I think Peter was burdened. And that burden showed itself, even with a little emotion and a little passion. I wonder sometimes in our concern about being so doctrinally precise, so theologically correct, so homiletically sound, that maybe we tend to avoid having a little little passion every now and then. But it doesn't go from verse 39 to verse 41 Peter just didn't just get up and go, listen, God is sovereign, you are depraved, Jesus is Messiah, period. He didn't do that. Peter had not just the logos, but he had the pathos, the passion. He was emotional. He pled, he persuaded, be saved from this corrupt generation. And that really is a distinctive mark of New Testament preaching and New Testament evangelism. It has this air of urgency, this air of passion about it. That Paul could literally say, I would wish myself accursed for the sake of my brethren. That he pleads with the lost to come to Christ. 
Something is desperately wrong with our theology if it does not lead us to passion, and a passion not just for God, but a passion for souls, a passion for the lost, a passion to plead with people, be saved from this corrupt generation. I want to follow in the example of Peter. I want to be someone who passionately pleads. I want my preaching, I want my personal evangelism, I want my witness and my life to be characterized by a passion and an urgency to connect everyone to Jesus Christ. The what must I do is not just about what it means to be saved. I believe there's even implications here for what must we do as gospel preachers, gospel teachers, professors, students. Don't let all of the academia, all of the theology, the philosophy, all of the knowledge come at the expense of a passion for the gospel. Not just to sit in your little circle of friends talking about the gospel amongst those who are already believers, but a passion for the gospel to do like Peter, to proclaim to those who don't yet know Christ. There's forgiveness, there's hope, there's an answer. Be saved from this corrupt generation. May we find encouragement and exhortation here in this example, in this model, in what Peter did, empowered by the Spirit of God. May God also use us as we look towards Sunday and every opportunity God gives us. What must we do? Faithfully proclaim the gospel. Call people to repent and to believe and do so with a burdened passion for the lost. Amen.